Hi, uh, welcome everyone to the Q&A with the director Lauri Randla, the, who directed our opening night film Goodbye Soviet Union. He could unfortunately not join us at the festival, but we have um, an interesting Q&A lined up for you. Um, so yeah, let's dive right in, Lauri. Um, there are a lot of the film is based on your personal experiences, and I'm just wondering how you kept the line between, you know, how much to share from yourself and how much you fictionalized, um, if you could talk about the screenplay. Well, the project started in uh, 2008 when I was applying to film school. And I had to write, one of the assignments was to write an uh, autobiography where you used five or six elements from your real life. And you kind of like constructed um, a story around those facts. So I chose the facts like I was born immaturely and put into an incubator that I had to move into an enclosed city. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I borrowed the Indian dialect, uh, of course, and uh, the first love experiences and the fact that my mother had to go to Finland to work and I had to stay in the Soviet Union as a pawn. Um, so, uh, Around those elements, uh, then, uh, well, the first version was like, it had like, let's say 24 characters, like it's too much. So I had to start to combine uh, those characters. For example, in real life, uh, the only person who got evicted from the city was my uncle. He, he visited us and he was a photographer um, uh, for his profession. So he had a camera with him at Silana, which is forbidden. And he went uh, on the beach, which was which is an absolutely beautiful place. And uh, he took a photo, and we had the reactor or the plant uh, in in the left corner of the photo. And the, the KGB arrested him, and he disappeared for two days. And I borrowed that kind of family experience that we had from Silama uh, to the movie, but uh, in, in the film, it kind of like uh, includes the entire family. Mm -hmm. And this is such recent history. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's something that we see a lot in Baltic cinema yet, um, but I think it's exciting that that's starting to be explored. But also, not just you, but also I think many of your actors must have had a, um, you know, their personal memories and, and their kind of, I won't say triggers, that's a bit too hard, but like, how did they incorporate their own memories at that time into the film? And did you accommodate for that or? or how did you work with them? Yeah, uh, well, actually, I, I commented the experiences, of course. For example, the uh, birth giving scene, it's uh, not my mother's face to give birth in silence. It was it was uh, DOP's Ellen Lopman's mother who had that fate. And when Ellen told me about doing the rehearsals about, uh, about that incident, I said that that's so stupid that we're going to have to include it in the movie, you know. So, yeah, her mother was free. I mean, in the whole way, because there was not enough room uh, in real life, and uh, because she was screaming there, the uh, nurse came and said, that shut up, that so we didn't give birth in silence. So that's what we borrowed there. And uh, also the set designer or the production designer, she, she's uh, 20 years older than me, so she had uh, experiences of that system when she was an adult, so she could add a lot of uh, details there. And uh, of course, Ulla Barrios, who played like grandmother, she was... In Soviet Union, she was a movie star. So a Soviet Union, she experienced the Soviet Union in a very different way than the rest of us. And uh, all that got kind of borrowed there, of course, yeah. No, that's amazing that you can, yeah, kind of suck up everyone's tiny little stories and, and make a whole. Um, so I was also wondering about the, the minorities. I think, I mean, at least for me and maybe for many other people, this is the first time that they hear about the Finnish Ingrians and you made Vera and her brother are, are Chechen, which I think also isn't something that you see maybe very often in, in Baltic cinema. Um, what was your thinking behind that? Well, um, it was big news for me that I was Ingrian. I was, I remember I was three years old and I was playing uh, with my Russian friends in Siloma because that town was like 99.9% Russian. And suddenly the kids tell me, you're not Russian. And I'm like, what? Because that was like, Russian was the first language I learned. So I went back home and I started to ask, who am I? And then, well, yeah, my grandmother told me that we're Ingrians, that they're, they're Finns, that uh, they're, they're a tribe of Finns that moved uh, to Leningrad area um, about in the 1700s or something like that. 
And until Stalin's purges in 1930, you could live in the Leningrad area and live in your small village and just speak Finnish. You never had to be able to use uh, Russian. But that, that all changed in 1930 when uh, Stalin was preparing to attack Finland and uh, a big Finnish minority right uh, in, in the middle of Leningrad it was not a, uh, something that he could accept. So that's when the deportations and all that started. And uh, I grew up with these stories, and uh, at the moment I'm writing a TV series about my grandmother's experiences. But ingredients were also big news for every every single child that I've ever met in Estonia, because when I moved to Tartu, which is a predominantly Estonian city, and I presented myself as an ingredient, nobody knew what that was. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's a very small group of uh, Finns, uh, they were called Leningrad Finns, uh, at first, and uh, many of them kind of like incorporated as part of the Russian society, more like, you know, the language is completely disappearing. I'm not 100% sure, but as far as we know at the moment, uh, I haven't met no one that understands or speaks the dialect younger than me. So I hope there is. I could be wrong. Uh, I hope there is because it would not be a nice thing to be a dinosaur, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. And and so the Chechen, the two Chechen children, did you um, kind of make the link? Oh, oh well, I'm a minority, they're a minority, or was it just kind yeah, of? Yeah, the, the, the minority idea was, was there, but in real life, um, uh, the girl was Ossetian, but mm -hmm. it's such a small nation, you know, um, it's right next to Chechnya, actually, uh, but but the financiers were like, nobody's going to know who are Ossetians, we already have ingredients, my head is going to explode, you know, so... <laughs> Then we agreed that, okay, Chechens, they're the people in the Caucasus that are pretty famous. So, uh, you know, and, uh, that, was, that was the reason to choose the Chechen. Um, the film is also very uh, colorful, which I think maybe people, um, you know, I, I, the stories that I've been also told about the Soviet Union is kind of the opposite of that. You know, it's um, my parents' memories are very uh, gray and, you know, everyone was wearing gray clothes and everything. But so why did you make that choice? Is it from your memory or or how did well, you? Our memories, I, I, I think our memories are wrong. And there's I was surprised about it myself because I remember that exactly the way you described it. And there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, when I looked at the old photos of the Soviet Union, they do look by color exactly like you described Ray and Dahl. But there's a catch. Uh, it's the Soviet film that it's filmed on. It didn't have the ability to uh, represent colors as they were. <laughs> it's very Soviet again. So uh, we stumbled upon a book uh, that was released in 1979. It was by Preet who is an expatriate Estonian, who returned to Soviet Union with the Kodak camera, with the Kodak film. And he took photos around Soviet Union, and it was a colorful place. And we were really surprised because I remember from my childhood, in Soviet Union, they had also problems with producing colors to paint houses. I'm not kidding. So they were like, green was available, maybe blue and yellow, and that's it. You know, that's all you have. And the problem was that the colors were made of, I don't know from what, but they didn't mix with each other. You couldn't mix the colors, which was also amazing. So that's why we saw in those books, like blue, green, yellow, and red colors. And we decided that, hey, we, we should use them because the Soviet Union has been represented so many times in cinema through Orvo film, which is a uh, film that is not capable of presenting those colors. So we wanted to approach it a bit different. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk next about um, the actors that you selected and, and how did you um, get your cast together? Well, I, I think that my predominant feeling was that to create or recreate uh, an English dialect, we would uh, need someone who speaks Russian and uh, Finnish. And as far as it looks like, it, it proved to be right. It, it made those two languages made life a lot easier for the actors because they could, when they read uh, the dialect, they could understand what it meant, about 90% of it. With, uh, for example, Lula Karyosta, who does not speak uh, Finnish, it was a lot harder, but she managed it very well. Um, but it, it required a lot of work. 
And for example, Phil Moya, who played the grandfather, he has uh, Finnish uh, language skills, and so does his son Taro, who played Korea. So uh, it just kind of proved that uh, you can build the Indian language with the understanding of Finnish Savo dialect and, and, and Russian. And it was very interesting to, we wanted to make, we also had a person who was uh, familiar with the Indian language and was teaching it to the actors, of course. But we wanted to uh, make sure that we can catch at least the version of the Indian language that my grandma parents spoke um, before it disappears. The Indian dialect that is presented in the uh, Goodbye Soviet Union movie is a mix of Russian and Ingrian. It's because we lived in an area that is predominantly Russian, so we start to incorporate uh, Russian words more and more uh, into your speech. So that was the effect of it. Right. And I read somewhere that you had a, like a workshop with your whole cast before the screening. Yeah. yeah. So can you talk about why you chose to do that and what, what you wanted to get out of your actors? Well, I do a lot of writing, for, first of all. So uh, when I direct, I direct for once a year or once every second year. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big pause. So I usually do, for one, I do those workshops for myself. So I need to warm up. But I also have noted that you can't really tell much about the actors in, in, in a small casting session where, where they play with you for about 30 minutes in front of you and then they disappear. Because they're gonna try to show you the best side of them, but that you know, I also gonna have to see other sides of them, their best face, because we're gonna be together for ninety days, and we'll be under a lot of, a lot of stress. So uh, I tend to do a small workshop, and uh, yeah, that's more time for me to evaluate people and to get to know how they work. And my first assignment, of course, is to find out how can I help an actor. Everybody is different, so you cannot copy paste uh, those. Uh, tools that you use with one actor to another. Right. So you're going to have to uh, take some time and get to know them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why we did uh, the workshop and also we practiced the English dialect. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and then I'm, I'm also wondering whether the film has uh, screened in Finland or what the reaction is there. Um... Well, yeah, it has. Uh, after the pandemic started, we finally managed, we were supposed to screen it in March, but in 2020, but we managed to do it in July, I think. It was June or July. And uh, well, in, in some ways, Corona kind of maybe helped a bit because uh, it was the first cinema released in, in movie theaters uh, when the restrictions were lifted. So I think it kind of helped me a bit because it was the most watched movie for weekend which is unheard of for an estonian movie in film. amazing yeah <laughs> it hasn't happened and uh, so far uh, i think it's about twenty seven thousand uh, thirty thousand something like that viewers in cinema but it has also been shown in uh, via play which is a like you know a version of netflix here local elisa entertainment and so forth i don't know how many people have seen that but uh the reaction has been pretty positive, um, mostly. So um, I think this movie is could be frustrating to some people who don't know much about the Soviet Union. For example, the younger generation has difficulties of understanding in a society where you can't have bananas. Like, what the hell is that? You know, they, they don't think that it's real, but the bananas are is just a metaphor or an allegory also. Yeah, yeah. So, there were a lot of deficits of more than just bananas. There was a deficit of everything, pretty much. So, um, yeah, but it, it has been pretty positive because uh, it doesn't show the Soviet Union through the eyes, through the regular eyes, I would say, like we used to see it. Mm -hmm. And what are your, the final question I'm, I'm going to ask you is, um, I'm sure our audiences will want to see more of you. So what do you have coming up with? What are your next plans? Well, I'm running a TV series uh, about my grandmother's experience. It's going to be a six episode mini series or closing series, whatever it's called. And um, uh, it's about how she came to Auschwitz and through Auschwitz to Finland and back to Soviet Union. It's a, you know, easy going road movie. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, that's, that's the main thing I'm doing. And uh, I also have one uh, kids movie in development and uh, Another TV series coming uh, on Finnish television or Ellis Entertainment. 
so to speak. Um, but that I can't disclose yet. What kind of job it's going to be? So. Keep keep us guessing. We'll we'll uh, follow your career with with excitement. So thank you for joining us for this this Q and A, and um, hope to see you soon. And and yeah, look forward to your next projects. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Bye.